Today we're talking about sampling. No, not the sneaky snacks you take while shopping in the bulk food store, and definitely not the reason why you go to Costco on your lunchtime. We're talking archaeological sampling. Why we need it, how we do it, and what we can infer from it. Since it's either not needed or impossible to excavate an entire site, archaeologists employ sampling techniques in order to get a clear picture of an area without having to sort through and analyze extremely large amounts of information and artifacts. There's also always that pesky problem with funding, so you can't always get what you want. The harsh reality of the beast is that, yeah, we can't get to everything in every region. So we use sampling techniques to make peace with that. And hopefully the information that we get out of this sample gives us a proper representation of that area. Now, while it does sometimes seem like lazy or not very productive, I will point out that it's actually within the best practices of the site to leave some areas covered up because leaving areas untouched are also very good for the site as excavation actually does destroy the site, right? Because you're digging and you're going through all of these layers and you're taking things out and destroying that area, that level of settlement. So it's very, very good to make sure that you keep a section of the site or some parts of the site unexcavated to preserve it, but also, you know, for the future, if any sort of technique gets better, less something less damaging, things like that, it's always good to make sure we're preserving the site at some level, which is why sampling is always very good to do. Now, the main goal of sampling is to be able to come to sound conclusions of an entire site or region based on only a fraction of that area. And the best way to do that is through statistical methods. Most university archaeology programs do actually have a mandatory statistics class for this purpose. I'm sorry my artsy friends, math and science always have a way of uh, creeping up on us even though you're trying to run away from it. It's just how the world works. And it's depressing. And of course, to go alongside math, we have theory. Using the statistics, we then employ probability theory. Much joy, much fun, much headache. But that's why we call it probabilistic sampling. Prob prob probabilistic, probabilistic sampling. Anyways, it's through the use of math that we make sure that the probability of these generalizations that we're making from this sample are as correct as possible. It's the same thing they do when making a public opinion poll or like what they do on Family Feud. There are four main probabilistic sampling techniques used by archaeologists and they all sound very confusing and overwhelming, so let's try and get through this together. So the first one we're going to talk about is called simple random sampling. This technique is used to understand the site as a whole and not just the areas that we know where something is going to be found. Usually, the areas to be sampled are chosen using a table of random numbers. Nowadays, of course, to rule out the bias with all of the sampling, there are computer programs that actually do this for you. Once you define your area, you determine the size of your sample units, how many sample units you want, and the amount of area that you want to sample. Of course, the more you sample, the greater the accuracy of your prediction will be. There are drawbacks to this method, of course. One is that you have to know or define your site borders beforehand, which can be difficult because that means you have to really make sure you know the borders of your site before the sampling takes place. And that's not always easy to know until the sampling is completed. So it's one of those catch-22 things going on there. Secondly, of course, the random assigning of numbers in that table can actually cause some sort of clusters to form sometimes throughout the sampling site, which means that some areas will have larger areas of sampling than others. And all of these clusters will make it inherently biased to those areas that are being sampled, so we don't really want that. To help rectify this problem of inherent bias, we now must bring in sampling technique number two, stratified random sampling. This is where the region that you're sampling is divided into its own natural sort of zones. So we have, you know, for example, we have cultivated land, we'd have forests, we'd have riverbanks, etc., etc. The sampling units are then chosen using the same technique as simple random sampling, but this time it's in proportion to each natural zone. For example, if the region to sample is 50% forest, then 50% of these random sampling zones will be taken from the forest. This makes sure that sampling doesn't really favor one area over another, and it makes sure that everything is proportional to the site. Another method is called systematic sampling, where, well, you 
come up with a system for the sampling. That one's pretty straightforward. You essentially make a grid of equally spaced locations to sample. So you can say I'm going to sample every, every other square, every three squares, things like that. As long as it's an, an even sort of system, it's up to you. This method is sort of the simplest one to follow. The good and the bad thing about this method is that with such regular spacing, you can either hit or miss every single diagnostic thing in an equally regular pattern which in itself causes its own bias. So just keep that in mind if you're using this method. So because systematic sampling isn't the best option, you can make a hybrid technique. Ooh, very exciting. And because sampling technique names don't seem to be the most creative in the archaeology world, the name for this technique is called Stratified Unaligned Systematic Sampling, or as I call it, SUS because you can very effectively suss out a situation. You can troll me for that really horrible pun in the comment section, but it's staying in the video. You're gonna remember sus because of this really bad pun, so you're welcome. This technique combines all three methods that we just talked about. First, you make a grid, you make a normal grid with standard sections, then you lay it over the site, but you align it towards the axis of the site. So you make sure that everything's kind of aligned properly with where you're excavating or where you're sampling. So after you have that all laid out, you kind of make your own strata or groupings within that grid. Uh, it can be at your own choosing. So let's say four squares by four squares, for example. So then you'll have a section of 16 squares. Then within that group of 16 squares, one or two are going to be chosen at random for sampling. This method ensures that there's no bias in the sampling, but it also makes sure that the squares are much more evenly spaced out over the whole site. That one's kind of my favorite. It is a little bit more complicated. Of course, that being said, all of these methods of sampling that we just talked about have been tested and you can pretty much choose any single one that you want on a sampling campaign. But now, of course, after watching this video, you are now knowledgeable and armed with the pitfalls and the advantages of each method. So you can pick and choose based on what the best thing for your site will be. Sampling is so important in archaeology, so it's very good to have a proper grasp on the concept. Anyways, I have been craving a trip to the Bulk Barn ever since I mentioned it at the beginning of this video, but seeing as we don't have that in the Netherlands, the best option for me is to go to a cheese shop, one of those uh, touristy cheese shops, and eat my fill of cheese there. So that's what I'm gonna do now, but as always, for a full write-up on all of the sampling techniques that we talked about today, and as well as some extra resources, I have um, put all of that on my website. A link to that is in my description down below, so go ahead and click that. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel, and if you like these videos and what I do, consider becoming a patron on Patreon so I can up my game and continue to bring you really cool, amazing content. Stay dirty, my friends.